Um, good evening and welcome. My name is Rowan Gray. I'm a Columbia Law School student. I'm one of the organizers of this series. Uh, thank you very much for everyone who made it out on a Friday evening. Uh, appreciate you taking the time and hopefully you won't be here for too late so you can all go out afterwards. Um, I won't speak for very long apart from saying that uh, this is the third event in an eight-part series that we've got going on here at the Law School evaluating different issues currently uh, affecting the global monetary system and the global economy. And uh, we really encourage you to look at the materials we have online, look at all the other events, and uh, if you can't make it to a particular event, that they will be live streamed and videos will be posted up afterwards. So please stay involved and please keep uh, asking questions online afterwards. Uh, but without further ado, I'll introduce uh, Professor Uge to introduce the uh, speakers and start off the seminar. Thank you very much and congratulations. Uh, I've been told that by having a class at 1.20 on Friday afternoon uh, at the uh, law school I would have no students, which proves wrong, but having this crowd at 6.30 is an event. Um, we're going to try to make it as close and as instructive as possible. Uh, there have been, as the title says, some design defects and some policy failures. And so that's going to be the focus about the Eurozone crisis, although I'm sure we will go to a few other things. Just to put things in three minutes in perspective, in December 2009, when we discovered the amplitude of the numbers of the Greek uh, deficit and indebtedness, which supposedly wasn't known by Eurostat before, Mrs. Merkel said, this is not a problem for Europe, this is not a problem for the Euro, it's a problem for the Greeks. Uh, almost three years after, yesterday, Mario Draghi, the president of the European Central Bank, was still arguing whether he was prepared to take some losses on the Greek bonds that eventually he bought in the 2008 and 2009 period. Uh, the ECB balance sheet blew up from 500 to 3 trillion euros and is well on its way to get to 4 if they do what they say they would do, which is to buy Spanish and Italian bonds, which, by the way, they haven't started doing. Markets are optimistic that they will do so, which is true. Nobody knows how much, nobody knows when, but a little bit of optimism is helpful. Um, to discuss that, I'm going first to introduce uh, Marshall Auerbach. Sorry. Oh, you're sorry, it's you first. I'm sorry. Yeah, because I was sorry. Uh, Yanis, he's a real professor. He's a professor of economics. He teaches economic theory at the uh, University of Athens. He's a visiting professor at the Lyndon B. Johnson uh, Graduate School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas. And he is the household, the in-house economist with Valve or Valve software. I'm sure we'll talk to you about that. But more interestingly, Basically, he is guilty because he was advising the president, the prime minister of Greece, George Papandreou, until 2007. And the crisis happened just after he left. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he has not only a theoretical view, but he has been in the trenches of the Greek situation. And I'm sure that what he has to tell us is going to be totally fascinating. So, Yanis, sorry for missing your first step, but we are very happy that you're here and very interested in uh, listening to your part of the story. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, George, for the introduction. Yes, I'm guilty as charged. Uh, my only uh, defense is that after I stopped advising George Papandreou, um, firstly, he won the election, which he hadn't done when I was advising him. And secondly, after he won the election, I turned into an ardent critic of his government. Uh, Greece is not important enough to be occupying the headlines around the world for three years. Imagine a situation where a crisis in the state of Delaware was threatening to bring the United States of America down. If that happened, then the problem would not be with Delaware. It would have been with the United States of America. Let me not beat about the bush, ladies and gentlemen. The Eurozone is disintegrating. And I shall just call upon Exhibit A without a B or C to follow. 
one euro in a Greek bank account has a much lower present value, expected value, than one euro in an Italian account. And a euro in an Italian account has a lower expected value than a euro in a Parisian bank account, which has a lower present value than a euro in a German bank account. In Nevada, which is, from what I hear, badly hit by the 2008 crisis, one dollar in a Nevada bank account has exactly the same present value as one dollar in a New York State bank account. And that tells the story. Now, hindsight is not a very good guide to the truth. Most of my Anglo-Saxon friends, colleagues, academics, journalists, utilizing the benefit of hindsight, turn around and say to me, well, what did you expect? You Europeans had the audacity of binding together such disparate economies in one currency union. Did you expect it to work? Well, it didn't work, but that's not because it could, it could not have worked. Come to think of it, take the United States of America again. It is a union of very disparate economies. The economy of Missouri and the economy of California are just as different as the economy of Portugal and the economy of France or Germany. Indeed, within Germany, before the Eurozone was created and after, you will find that there are many regions that are totally at odds with one another. Bavaria and the eastern states of Germany, for instance. Very different economies, different vitality, different degree of capital accumulation. To put it differently, every country, every currency union, because the United States is a currency union, Britain is a currency union, indeed Germany was a currency union before the euro, comprises surplus regions and deficit regions. Take the United Kingdom, for instance. Yorkshire is always going to be in deficit to London. And Wales is always going to be in deficit vis-a-vis -vis England. And yet these currency unions do not give rise to crises which lead the English to saying that the Welsh must be thrown out of the United Kingdom or the people of Missouri will have to pack up the bags and leave the United States of America. Now, there are, of course, political and social and cultural reasons why that doesn't happen. But the reason why we have a very different situation in the Eurozone is completely and utterly economic. And it has to do with the way we create it. And clues to the problems that we have in Europe now can be sought quite profitably in the 1920s. Because the 1920s were typified by a common currency of that era. It was a gold standard. The gold standard's significance in this context is that it bound together different currencies in fixed exchange rates with gold and with one another, creating effectively a single currency. It could be, of course, that it was, of course, that you know, the French had the franc and the Germans had the mark and the Americans had the, the dollar, and yet these were locked into one another in a fixed way and vis-a-vis -vis gold. So effectively, the, the capitalist world in the 20s was operating as if under the same currency. The end of the 1920s saw the crash of 1929, a financial implosion which began in Wall Street. And what was the, the first thing that happened? The first thing that happened was infection of Main Street from Wall Street and a very quick disintegration of the common currency of the era, the gold standard. It was indeed Roosevelt's great move, the first thing that he did to get the United States out of the gold standard and follow Britain down that road. The country that didn't do it and was hanging on for dear life within the gold standard was Holland, and it had the worst impact of the Great Depression. Now, the, the lesson from this uh, part of, of our common history is that if you try to create a common currency, a fixed exchange regime, more or less the same thing, uh, from the, an economic point of view, and you lack a way of balancing or recycling, as I'd like to say, 
the deficits of the deficit regions with the surplus of the surplus regions, then the, 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 those regions are going to start shifting under the weight of the surpluses and the deficits that increase, and like tectonic plates, eventually they will create the circumstances for an earthquake, like they did in 1929. In the United States of America, there is a common currency binding the different states together, but there is also a surplus recycling mechanism, or actually various surplus recycling mechanisms. Let me just give you a couple of examples. I could give a lot more. When in 2008 we had the crash here in New York, in Wall Street, immediately the state of Nevada, Nevada faced a major, major recession which had to do with the bursting of the bubble in real estate there. Now imagine what would have happened if the state of Nevada had to bail out the banks state domiciled in Nevada. And also if the state of Nevada had to borrow internationally without access to printing presses in order to pay for the unemployment benefits for a population whose unemployment rate was skyrocketing. What would happen is this. The banks of Nevada and the state of Nevada would have sunk without a trace, hugging each other like two very weak swimmers in stormy waters. This is what's happening in the Eurozone. So the fact that it's taxes in New York and in California that help ameliorate the problem of paying unemployment benefits in Nevada is a form of surplus recycling. Let me give you a second example, because I promised two. When Boeing gets a contract from the Pentagon to build a new fighter jet or whatever, drones, I don't know what, one of the conditions for that contract is that new production facilities are going to be built in Minnesota, in Missouri, in Tennessee, in Arizona in the deficit regions. This is not an act of philanthropy on the part of the Pentagon towards the deficit regions of the United States. It's just pragmatic economics. Because only by building a production facility in a deficit state do you create in that deficit state a flow of income. People get jobs and start working. They're not getting benefits. They're getting income from productive activity. And then they can keep buying goodies, goods and services from California and from New York State, from the surplus countries, countries, states, so as to maintain the flow of economic activity that allows California to maintain its surpluses vis-a-vis -vis Arizona. California is always going to have a surplus vis-a-vis -vis Arizona. So these surplus recycling mechanisms, and there are various such mechanisms, are essential for keeping the union going. So to, the, to my Anglo-Saxon, particularly British, Eurosceptic friends, I say the fact that we brought together disparate countries under the, the same currency is not the problem per se. The problem is that we did it in a gold standard fashion without a surplus recycling mechanism, hoping that it would float. After the war, the United States of America emerged as the only serious surplus producing country following the human catastrophe of the Second World War in Europe, in Japan, everywhere. In the Bretton Woods Conference, Britain and the United States, particularly, had agreed on one thing. They want to reconstitute a form of the gold standard, fixed exchange rates. That was a Bretton Woods system of fixed exchange rates, where the dollar was the only uh, currency which was convertible with gold, but all the other currencies were fixed in their exchange rates vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. But they had learned the lesson of the past, and they were quite determined to have a surplus recycling mechanism within this Bretton Woods international system, where they disagreed John Mannion Keynes was the representative of the Brits in Bretton Woods, was in Keynes's determination to establish that surplus recycling mechanism formally, to create an international system, he called it an international clearing union, that would transparently, and as a result of institutional hard work, ensure that surpluses are redistributed as productive investments or flows into the deficit countries in order to keep the Bretton Woods system, the post-war, if you want, gold standard, revamped, uh, going. 
and to avoid a new 1929. The United States of America at the time, being the surplus producer, had a slightly different idea. They did not disagree with the concept that surplus recycling had to take place, but they just wanted to do it themselves. It was our surplus. We're going to distribute it any way we want, and we're not going to do it in the context of a multilateral international institution, which is precisely what they did. The Marshall Plan is part of that story, but not just the Marshall Plan. For 15, 20 years, the United States of America was recycling a significant part of its surplus towards Germany and Japan, trying to prop up these two major economies in order to create currencies that were internationally uh, successful and powerful so as to create shock absorbers in case the American economy went into another recession. And the fear would then be that without any other powerful regions within the capitalist world, the Soviet Union, or some kind of um, sharp recession would jeopardize the prospects of world capitalism. This is how the Bretton Woods system worked and how the gold era of capitalism in the 1950s and 60s was founded. It died in 1971, famously on the 15th of August of 1971 when President Nixon announced the end of it. Why did it die? Because by the end of the 1960s, the United States of America no longer had a surplus. So how can you recycle a surplus if you don't have it? And then something quite remarkable happened. We entered a second period, a weird and wonderful second post-war phase, during which American hegemony and dominance was founded on a reversal of the flows of capital and goods. To put it bluntly, and I, I shall quote from Paul Volcker's famous 1971 brief to Henry Kissinger, if we can't recycle our surpluses, we will recycle other people's surpluses. <laughs> Which is precisely what happened between the 1970s and 2008. The United States of America operated like a huge vacuum cleaner, sucking into this land the net exports of Germany, of Japan and later of China, ever increasing deficits, trade deficits, were registered, but that was not a fault, it was part of the design. And who was paying for those deficits? Well, those deficits were being financed by a tsunami of capital that was flowing from Germany, from Japan and later from China, back into the United States through Wall Street, why? Because the profits that the Germans, the Japanese, the Saudis, uh, the Russians later, the Chinese were making found better returns in Wall Street. This is a big story as to how that was accomplished, but this is what was going on. This reversal of surplus recycling. During Bretton Woods, we had America recycling its own surpluses. Now we have America recycling everybody else's surpluses, utilizing its own deficits as the, as the locomotive that did it. That was the setting in which the Eurozone was born. The Eurozone is a child of this very weird and strange system of hegemony where the hegemon is basing his or her, her hegemony on deficits. During that era of the reversed flow of um, deficits and surpluses, still a surplus recycling mechanism, German capital, capital goods, machinery, was helping capitalize Europe. Throughout the breadth and width of the European continent, you will find somewhere Siemens or IG or some large German manufacturer having provided the infrastructure. Yet, Germany was never Europe's locomotive. The periphery of Europe provided Germany with the demand it needed to keep its export-oriented growth going. Germany was effectively was a net exporter of capital and consumption goods to the rest of Europe and a net importer of aggregate demand, demand for those goods, the, good, the, produ the products of the manufacturing sector. But to allow the Euro what is now the Eurozone back then 
the European common market, to function as if in equilibrium in that manner, it was essential that the United States of America continue to create demand for the whole of Europe through this vacuum cleaner that was sacking net exports both from Europe and Asia into the United States of America. Germany was utilizing the rest of Europe as a vital space that provided with the demand which was necessary for a, the accumulation of German surpluses that were in turn helping Germany globalize. German corporations globalize both here in the United States and in China later on. There was a threat to this process. The German industry was very well aware, and so were German uh, policymakers. The threat was coming from what we economists refer to as competitive devaluation, and I'll give you a very simple example. When Fiat found it hard to sell cars in Germany, because Volkswagen's technological innovations were faster, their factories were more efficient, and so on and so forth. The Bank of Italy, the Central Bank of Italy, would engineer a devaluation of the Italian lira vis-à-vis -vis the German Deutsche Mark. And suddenly, Fiat's were competitive again. This was a threat to the strategy of globalizing German corporations and building German surpluses by utilizing demand that was imported into Germany from the rest of Europe. It was something that German policymakers were very keen to undo. This is the framework in which the, Euro, the Eurozone, the idea of a common currency, emerged. Why did the European elites want to create the Eurozone? Each one of them for different reasons. The German elites had as a primary concern competitive devaluation. This is why they initially started the idea of an exchange rate mechanism that would limit the fluctuations of exchange rates within Europe. When that failed, they were prepared to go one step further towards a common currency. The French elite had a different idea. They had an, a variety of uh, motives towards a currency union. Firstly, you have to remember that French trade unions were always quite appetite and quite energetic. And unlike German trade unions, were not interested in a corporatist settlement, but they were going for high wage rates and wage growth. Secondly, the German elites were very keen to use the, relative, the, the comparative advantage that France had in the financial sector vis-à-vis -vis Germany. Germany was a powerhouse industrially. But French banks were far more globalized, far more advanced than the equivalent German banks. And f the French elites thought that by binding together Germany and, and, and France, not only would French labor be subdued, but also the French banking system would effectively take over the financing of continental Europe. And thirdly, Equally importantly, from the perspective of the French elites, the French are very good at administering things. Look at the OECD, look at the way that the Marshall Plan was administered, look at Brussels. Look at the way in which the European Union is being run. The Germans cannot even provide, even though they have the power to impose, a president of the European Central Bank. They just don't have good enough um, uh, apparatchiks to do the job. So this, let's go to Italy. And to my country, why did the Greek elites want to join a common currency? Simply because it had, they had had enough with inflation. Because inflation, competitive devaluations of the lira, of the drachma, were creating inflation, which was eating into the store of value of the, the well-off in, in our countries. Our workers, at the same time, were also, had also had enough of inflation because their hard-won uh, won battles at the, on the industrial field, strikes and so on, were very quickly reversed by an acceleration of inflation. So their, their higher wages, in the end, meant nothing. So there were many different motives for creating the Eurozone. But the Eurozone was created along the lines of the gold standard of the pre-1929 era, not along the lines of the Bretton Woods era. There was no surplus recycling mechanism. 
Come to think of it, during the run-up to the creation of the euro, to get into the eurozone, a country like mine or Italy had effectively to accept a slow-burning recession in its real economy, in its industry, in its farming, in the sectors of the economy where real material goods are being produced. If you look at industrial data, not overall national income data, you'll find that the price that our countries in the periphery of Europe paid to get into the Eurozone was effectively shrinkage. It was the only way by which to achieve the lower rates of, rates of inflation that were necessary in order to get into the Eurozone. Now, some people, many commentators, argue that oh, Europe created those rules called the Maastricht Treaty for getting into the Eurozone that put certain limits on the amount of indebtedness of states, 60% of GDP, and 3% of GDP in terms of deficits, in order to be allowed into the euro. But then they allowed countries like Italy, that had 120% of GDP in debt, to get in. So they, this was an error caused by optimism and by political pressure. Well, it was not an error. If I'm right in my hypothesis that competitive devaluation, especially vis-a-vis -vis Italy, was an essential motive for Germany to accept a transition from the Deutschmark to the Euro, then Italy had to be in. And do you know how Greece got in? I'll tell you, because friends of mine actually engineered it. What they did was they copied exactly what Italy did in order to do a makeover on our statistics. You know, you've heard of Greek statistics. They are Italian statistics and French statistics. The Greeks are not inventive enough to create their own means of manipulating the data. My mates at the University of Athens, who also worked at the Ministry of Finance at the time, simply copied exactly what the Italians did. They then got evidence that this is what the Italians did. And then they said to the Europeans, look, we've done what they did. If you don't let us in, we will expose you. And we will simply ask the question, why is Italy allowed in when they've done exactly the same thing? Not to mention Germany, of course, right? Did you know that at some point Germany valued the gold held by the Bundesbank and counted it as an income of the German state so as to reduce the nominal deficit? Now, if Greece had done that, you know what we've been hearing about it. Anyway, the Eurozone is thus created. And what we have is a period of eight years, between 2000 and 2008, of low lethargic German growth in national income. Much lower than my country's. My country was growing at 4 and 5% when Germany was barely growing at 1%. Compared to France, Germany was growing at a slower rate. Its prices were growing at a, at a slower rate. But at the same time, investment was growing much faster. German reunification had unleashed a very large amount, number, if you want, of workers. A pool of labor was discovered as if, and it was not just in East Germany, because with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Iron Curtain, Slovakia opened up to German industry, uh, the Czech Republic, Poland, and that squeezed real wages in Germany and real wages that German industry had to pay beyond belief. These were the changes that made, between 2000 and 2008, German industry far more competitive, creating a divergence in competitiveness within the Eurozone. The rest of Europe, even France, was experiencing, was experiencing this slow-burning recession which was necessary in order to enter into the, into the Eurozone, and then after the creation of the Eurozone, was rewarded effectively by a very large flow of capital. Our productive capacities were shrinking relative to those of Germany, but our income was rising. Why? Because we had all this capital flowing in. And where did that capital come from? Two sources private money minted by Wall Street banks and the City of London, also known as derivatives, that were creating tsunamis effectively of private money, 
which then had to go somewhere to find high returns, and they took the risk of coming into my country, into Ireland, into Spain, creating bubbles in the real estate sector, in the public sector in my country. And the second source of capital that was flowing into the periphery of Europe was, of course, German profits, which had to go somewhere, since they were not being spent in Germany because the growth rate of, of, of Germany was being kept low. So we had this amazing situation between 2000 and 2008 where the periphery was going faster than Germany on borrowed money, on money that was flowing into our countries from both Wall Street and Frankfurt. When in 2008 the pyramid of private toxic money created by Wall Street, the city and Frankfurt burned into ashes and collapsed under the weight of its own hubris, then, like a vicious tide, this capital, just as fast as it had moved in, moved out, like capital usually does. Think of South Korea, 1998, or Thailand. And then we had a liquidity crisis, which very quickly created an insolvency crisis in the most uh, fragile parts of the Union, Greece being the case in point. Once we reached that stage, and once, as George said, the Greek crisis was being treated by the Eurozone as a Greek crisis, as opposed to a systemic Eurozone crisis. And the medicine delivered was one of liquidation and shrinkage. The domino effect was bound to happen, precisely as it did in the 1929 to 1932-33 period, destroying the common currency of that era. Germany's refusal today to consider even the minimum steps that need to be taken in order to reverse this process of deconstruction of the Eurozone is not stubbornness, it's not an error, it's a straightforward application and dedication to the principles that built the Eurozone. The Eurozone was not an exercise in creating a federation or a common European home. It was an exercise, exercise, if I'm right in my hypothesis, in maintaining a model by which German corporations globalized on the basis of aggregate demand imported from the Eurozone. The Maastricht Treaty was essential for not creating a surplus recycling mechanism, the kind of recycling mechanism that would be necessary in order to save the Eurozone now. So in a sense, I completely and utterly understand Germany's commitment to not allowing the creation of a surplus recycling mechanism within the Eurozone. The tragedy is that by not allowing it, the Eurozone is doomed. Every single discussion in Europe, and this is my last sentence, about fiscal unions and banking unions if you look very carefully at the way in which German officials are describing them, you will find that this is just cheap talk, the purpose of which is to um, the purpose of which is to uh, confirm the whole talk about more Europe, more in the breach than in the observance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yanis. Uh, I think that the beauty of what we are going to have tonight is that the three of us have been on the ground on a number of ways and in two different angles. Uh, you've heard the story of the last 30 years. During those 30 years, uh, Marshall was in uh, investment management, so I think we'll be very interested to find out from him, when you live through that, how do you invest? But uh, he's also as I told you, an academic, his research at the Levy Institute at Bard College, research fellow for economics and peace and security, and he just became director of the institutional partnerships for, Insti for the Institute of New Economic Thinking. So we'll have a combination, again, of points of view, and then uh, we'll start debating it. 
probably a collaboration of points of view, since I don't have anything that's uh, distinctly different from what Jana said. Uh, um, I know that uh, economists, generally speaking, cannot resist using, using visual aids. Um, but uh, in contrast to most, I'm not going to use any mathematical equations or a bunch of Greek letters. I'm going to draw from popular culture and uh, start with this uh, YouTube clip from the film Misery, because I think it's a perfect metaphor for what uh, is being experienced in your right now. So we'll watch this. Mm. Oh, what do I press that? Do I? Uh, OK, there we go. All right. uh, there we go. Now you know why I never use too much. Okay. Oh. Well. I know you've been out. What? You've been out of your room. No, I haven't. Paul, oh. my little ceramic penguin in the study always faces due south. I could uh, probably just stop the talk right now and just say that's <laughs> that in a word has been uh, uh, the, the policy of the Troika for the last uh, five or six years. But um, you know, since I've been uh, kindly uh, offered a, a bit more of a time slot, I guess I could, should uh, say a few words as well. Um, if, if you are um, if you're somewhat squeamish about what you've just seen, uh, I apologize. But then um, just think of the five or seven years of collective punishment that. Uh, most of the citizens of Greece have been experiencing, or uh, in, in Italy, uh, Portugal, Ireland, Spain, and um, you know, you'll get some idea of what uh, the problems are today. The uh, European uh, authorities uh, within the Eurozone um, always do just enough to keep the patient alive. Um, and then when they uh, look set to get off the, the drip and, and start to uh, uh, recover, uh, they are hobbled by uh, the, the uh, um, austerity policies that have been imposed by the likes of the European Central Bank, and uh, therefore they're crippled. So they stay alive. So, so when I hear people say that, yes, the ECB has written the check and therefore has, uh, has um, made the, the whole situation operationally sustainable, um, that is true in a strictly economic sense. But um, Politics has a very funny way of, uh, of intervening in these kinds of events, and um, it is uh, difficult for me to envisage how the democracies of these countries are going to continue to uh, live in the uh, 21st century equivalent of a Victorian debtor's prison, which is essentially what is being uh, uh, requested of, uh, of uh, the likes of uh, the periphery countries right now. And if you just look at the data right now, um, the uh, euro area unemployment um, it uh, was at 11.4% uh, uh, as of August of this year. Um, 
the seasonally adjusted uh, rate uh, um, w was, um, uh, well, over the last 12 months, the rates have risen by 1.2 percent. There are now 25.466 million men and women uh, in the European uh, Union's 27 countries, uh, of whom uh, 18.196 million were in the euro area, and they were unemployed by August uh, 2012. So that's a record level of unemployment. <clears throat> Over the last 12 months, unemployment has increased 2.2 million uh, in the Europe, uh, European Union 27 and 2.1 million in the Eurozone. So um, whichever way you want to construct it, the Eurozone has failed to deliver what uh, should be the priority of, of any system, uh, which is to ensure that people have a secure income via work uh, and employment. Um, and, and I think uh, this is um, clearly, uh, as, as, as Giannis has pointed out, gone well beyond Greece. I mean. Um, Greece has become the uh, the poster boy, the whipping boy, um, and um, even though this is a country that has consistently been cutting uh, expenditures for the last five years, being told, being having done exactly what they said they would do, it's never enough. Um, uh, the uh, Greeks, for example, most recently uh, wanted to make uh, cuts in, in spending and lay off an estimated 15,000 civil servants by 2014. Uh, they also wanted to cut public spending by about 2 billion euros. And this is after five years of cutting spending. Uh, the Troika, which consists of the IMF, the ECB, uh, the Germans, um, basically said that's not enough. They want another 13.5 billion in cuts. Uh, and uh, the Guardian uh, of the UK implies that it is um, um, uh, not uh, the EU that is playing hardball right now in, 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 in um, Greece, it is the, the IMF. Uh, they are uh, intent on secure and high paid arrangements with massive uh, tax uh, breaks for uh, um, uh, the, the, the upper end. Um, but um, uh, this is the, 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 uh, the, the fund that has uh, you know, uh, created misery in untold uh, other continents, Asia um, in, and, and Latin America. So. Um, I, I would say, uh, in, in, with all due respect to uh, uh, my friend Giannis, uh, uh, Greece is, is irrelevant in the sense that, it, 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 of itself, it's not a significant issue. It's 2% of, of, of uh, GDP, and that's not to disparage the massive human suffering that is, uh, has been experienced there. But um, it's clearly become uh, uh, an example uh, pour décourager les autres. So you, 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 it is becoming a, a, a morality tale of what you uh, should uh, watch out for um, if you uh, want to ensure that this doesn't happen to you. Um, there has um, also been talk of um, a Grexit. Uh, um, somehow there's a feeling that if you just um, lop off this little cancer called Greece, uh, you can somehow then um, cauterize the rest of the wound uh, and, uh, and therefore everything is going to be okay um, and, and you can somehow manage to uh, save the, the, the rest of the, uh, of, of the Eurozone. Well, I, I think that's flawed on a, for, on a number of different levels. Um, one is, um, if you look at the Treaty of Maastricht, uh, there is no explicit exit mechanism. And um, uh, Janus has written some very good stuff on this. Um, it was pointed out that uh, you introduced uh, a no exit mechanism uh, because you wanted to ensure or convince people that this was inviolable, the, that the currency union w w was permanent. And so I think paradoxically, uh, if you are serious about that, uh, you have to, uh, um, the, the European Monetary Union is only as strong as the support you're prepared to confer on the weakest member. If you really want to convince people that you're uh, credible, that there is, that is the uh, union itself uh, is um, inviolate, that it is not going to be destroyed, then you have to back everybody. It would be, uh, to use the analogy of the United States, um, uh, I would suspect uh, that, uh, for example, states like Arkansas, or West Virginia have been deficit countries for most of their um, existence in the Union. But um, we don't say uh, to Mississippi or West Virginia, well, you are, you know, you are your cost of living is 20% overvalued relative to the rest of the country. Therefore, we want to internally deflate your economies. And if you don't listen, by the way, we're going to throw you out of the Union. In fact, you know, quite the opposite. We fought a civil war here, and uh, you know, it was to, to keep everybody in there. So, um, you know, it, it seems to be the opposite problem. Now, as I said, Greece is no longer um, uh, the, the the issue. Um, um, uh, Giannis wrote a very good piece recently uh, called uh, "The Battle of the Two Marios" between uh, D Mario Draghi and, and, and Monti. Um, I'm not even sure we're going to get that far. I think that the real battle right now is between Mario Draghi and and Mariano Mariano Rajoy, the the the, the Prime Minister of Spain. Now, um, here you've got a real disaster on your hands. It, it's, it's Greece writ large. Uh, um, you've got uh, um, a, a country with 25% uh, uh, unemployment and um, 
Okay, most of uh, you in the audience are um, law school students here at Columbia. You're uh, probably 25 or younger. Um, let's just take that as a, a given. Um, if you were living in Spain, more than half of you would be unemployed right now. Um, you might be lucky enough to be living with your parents, but of course they're probably going to, because mortgages are, are, uh, are, are, are recourse loans, uh, the parents are probably on the verge of being thrown out of their homes as well as the banking crisis uh, accelerates. So that's the problem you've got in, in, in Spain right now. And there's another element which I think uh, um, not, uh, there, there has been, um, to which insufficient attention has been uh, played, and, and that's um, the fragile nature of the political institutions within a country like Spain itself. And I mean no disrespect to uh, the Spaniards or to the great nation of Spain, but this is a country, remember, that was run by the generals but until the, the 1970s. The institutions of democracy are still relatively young in, the, in this country. And add to that, on top of this, you have the problem of, uh, of nascent uh, separatist sentiments. Uh, you've got uh, um, the, the Catalonians, who have a very, very strong sense of uh, uh, autonomy. Uh, likewise with the Basques, the, the, the separatist problem there has only, uh, the violent separatist problem has only recently dissipated. And, and, and given the trajectory of, of, of current um, uh, European Union policy, it's, it's quite evident to me that this uh, sort of a, a, a problem can be um, exacerbated if we continue to go along the route that we're going. So um, you can readily understand why the Prime Minister of Spain, even though he is in many respects profoundly sympathetic to the goals and aspirations of, uh, of the German Chancellor, uh, you can see why he is reluctant to, to um, place uh, Spain uh, under the, uh, the kinds of uh, uh, conditional austerity programs that are being asked for um, if, if they were to, join, if they were to um, um, sign up for a bond buying program on, on the part of the ECB. This is akin to the kind of deal that um, Clarice Serling was, uh, was uh, was getting from Hannibal Lecter, uh, you know, in the, in the Silence of the Lambs. You have this, you know, this cannibal in front of you saying, you know, quid pro quo, Clarice. And this is what, you know, this is really what um, is, is on the cards for countries like Spain. And of course, um, if Spain does go ahead, um, it, 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 they are bound to fail, as they have been failing so far, because like Greece, they've been cutting, uh, they've been cutting very, very steadily. And, um, um, you know, they, 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 surprise, surprise, have not been able to get their deficits um, any lower. So even those who wrongly diagnose uh, the, the problems in Europe as being one of, uh, of, of public profligacy are um, uh, uh, introducing policies which are uh, actually exacerbating the problem. You, you deflate these economies into the ground, your tax revenues get uh, uh, um, uh, d diminished, uh, the uh, payments from the uh, automatic stabilizers, the social welfare expenditures increase, and surprise, surprise, uh, your deficits get up. And that's on top of the, the, the the institutional limitations which we were brought up with in the, in, in the Eurozone. And the, the, these have been um, the, the two obvious ones I'll, I'll, I'll mention. Uh, you probably know them all already. But um, they, of course, all gave up their monetary sovereignty uh, when they joined the, the European Union. Um, they effectively converted themselves from being um, uh, national states with fisc full fiscal sovereignty uh, to being uh, uh, like states of the Union. They became users of currency rather than uh, issues of currency. And secondly, um, they submitted to uh, an arbitrary uh, stability and growth pact, which was designed by the German finance minister at the time, Theo Weigel, the, um, uh, which stated that um, uh, the overall public debt to GDP ratio should be no greater than 60%, and budget deficits should be no greater than 3% of, of GDP on an annual basis. Now, I will tell you, you can read any economics textbook, and I promise you, there is no empirical or th theoretical justification for those numbers. You know, you could look anywhere. You can look in, you know, um, Greg Mankiw's uh, textbook that they give all the Harvard uh, first-year economics students. You could probably look at any uh, um, economic textbook here that they give you in the, in, in, at Columbia. But I guarantee you won't find any uh, justification with that number. And you're probably wondering how those numbers came up about. Well, you know, it's interesting because the secret has finally been revealed. Um, there is a recent story in uh, um, a... Um, um, Aujourd'hui en France, which uh, um, tells us why we have the the three percent number for the stability and and, and growth pact, and um, the confession came from uh, a uh, Guy Abbe, who is a former uh, senior budgetary uh, ministry official. Uh, he was the inventor of the concept. He he said, and I quote, "We came up with the three percent figure in less than an hour." <laughs> It was a back-of-the-envelope calculation without any theoretical reflection. Reflection. Mitterrand needed an easy rule that he could deploy in his discussions with ministers who kept coming into his office to demand money. We needed something simple. 3%. Pourquoi pas? Um, it was... <laughs> 
It was a good number that it stood the test of time. It was reminiscent of the Trinity. So this is the number that they came up with. You know, why not 1%, why not 2%, why not 5 or 7%? And these are the, 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 the mandarins, you know, the enakian, the, the so-called policy elites. And this is how, uh, how, how policy making, is. It, it's symptomatic of all the problems that we have. And yet this is treated as something akin to the, the, uh, the, the holy gospel. So, I mean, that, that's a, a, another problem you have. And uh, as I say, uh, there, there is um, um, no rational uh, reason why we have these uh, figures, um, we, uh, but we stick to them as if it's a, it's a Bible, and it is a clearly uh, increasing problems. And, 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 and the other irony, of course, the, the sad tragedy is that um, the noble aspirations which underline the European Union, uh, the, the desire for uh, ever closer union to prevent the horrors of the, the Second World War and to prevent some of the dark aspects of the, of the, the continent's past uh, from being repeated, are actually being exacerbated by the, uh, the, 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 the harsh implementation of this rule. Um, in Greece right now, uh, the Golden Dawn, which is a neo-Nazi party, now its popularity stands at 22%. It's the third highest uh, party in, in, uh, in, in, in Greece. It's, it's, a, it's a head now of, the, uh, of, of, uh, of PASOK. So you have of Syriza, New Democracy, and, 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 and Golden Dawn. Uh, you, have, uh, you had uh, Marine Le, Martine Le Pen uh, uh, establishing uh, herself in a very significant way in, in, in France. Um, and, and my guess is that um, you know, the, the, the terrible thing is that this, uh, this so far, the populism uh, has found a, reposit a repository in the non-mainstream uh, Euro parties. And um, that's why uh, I think there's been little political traction gained so far. Because even though you listen to, you know, I was listening to an interview not too long ago where the, uh, the leader of the far-right party for the uh, Austrians uh, um, uh, was speaking about the Euro. And his criticisms were very, very cogent. And the problem is the rest of his, uh, his, uh, his policies would create a dystopian nightmare in the, in, in, in the country. So um, I think... Uh, the the uh, uh, what 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 could change the political dynamics uh, significantly in the years ahead is when a mainstream party begins to uh, uh, start embracing some of the populist rhetoric and and indeed start to explicitly threaten a, a, a euro exit. And if I had to make a guess, I would say that uh, the, the a very strong possibility might be Italy. Um, Silvio Berlusconi, I'm not going to mount any defense of the man, his bunga bunga parties or you know, his, his preferences, uh, what he does in his private time. But I will say this, the man has very, very good political antennae. It, he um, did respond to the Tangentopoli uh, crisis in the mid-1990s by creating a brand new uh, Italian political movement, Forza Italia, which essentially wiped the mainstream parties off the map in Italy. So. Whatever else you can say about the man, and there's a lot you could say, I know, um, he has certainly got good political instincts. He has started to make some very, very strongly uh, anti-Euro noises. It's worth remembering that even though he is no longer prime minister, he is still the leader of the largest party within Italy, um, a, a man who um, is literally a comedian or a clown. Um, he, he's, he's now um, leading a party which is, has a, 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 a high, a substantial amount of votes in Italy in, in, in the polls right now. And it would not surprise me that um, if we get to the stage where um, uh, Mario Monti uh, does submit to uh, some of the conditionality that is being uh, demanded of uh, anybody who submits themselves to an ECB assistance program, um, decides to go in there, and, and Italy has the, it has the impact on Italy that uh, I expect it will do, then then um, you know that might be the time that uh, Mr. Berlusconi and, uh, might might strike. It's, it's, it, there's no reason why the, t the, the conditions in Italy should be uh, any different. The fact of the matter is that that country has not grown since it's been in the European uh, uh, Monetary Union. It's basically been flat all the way through. And by the way, speaking about the doctoring of the figures um, um, that Yanis uh, had mentioned before, um, there's a very good paper that was uh, done by an Italian professor, Gustavo Piga, where he uh, um, illustrated the uh, creativity with which the Italians used uh, derivatives to mask their own uh, public debt to GDP ratios when they entered the, the European uh, Monetary Union. And um, the person who was heading up the, uh, the, 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 who was a deputy treasury at that time, one of the senior bureaucrats within uh, Italy was Mario Draghi. So there's a certain karmic justice, I think, in the fact that he is now um, um, being forced to uh, be the, um, you know, deal with the, shall we say, the, the consequences or fruits of his, uh, his creative accounting uh, genius. Um, the, there are, um, I think, uh, 
some solutions which uh, have been uh, proposed on offer. I think we'll go into those in more detail when we discuss it. But um, what I will say is that, um, um, like Yanis, I, I don't think the uh, union uh, can survive in its current incarnation. My, my preference would be for a coordinated uh, dissolution. There is talk, um, um, particularly uh, within uh, Germany, you'll see, you hear uh, business, a number of business leaders who are saying in spite of the benefits, the mercantilist benefits that have been derived from the uh, adoption of the euro, that they, they have talked about um, uh, leaving uh, the uh, eurozone or at least creating a new uh, hard currency block uh, 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 and, and, and leaving the, the, the periphery countries to have a, a, a collective devaluation. Uh, one, amongst the leading proponents of that school of thought is, is Hans Olaf Henkel. Um, he's talked about saving Europe but not the, the euro. So we, maybe we can have two uh, uh, currencies. We can have one called the Neuro and maybe what we can call this, the other one the Pseudo or, or maybe we'll call it the Soro, you know, something like that. Um, but the, 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 the point is that it's, it's, it's superficially an attractive idea. Uh, you get a one-off revaluation from the Germans, a, a, a one-off devaluation on the other side. Of course, I think if Germany were to pull out, the whole thing would, do, would, would just collapse. And I, and, I, and I think if you're going to go that far, then why not just have a coordinated dissolution? Um, and the other point I would make with that sort of a situation is that it puts countries like France in a very difficult position. Because... Um, you know, France will have to make an existential choice. Is it this uh, disciplined uh, Teutonic uh, country uh, um, that has made Germanic-style reforms, or is it, in fact, a, a, a Mediterranean country? It's, it's, it's an interesting choice. Uh, after, as uh, Yanis has said, it's uh, not a country that maybe would accede to the same kind of uh, wage discipline that the, uh, the Germans have, have uh, acceded to. Um, um, this is, after all, the, the place where the guillotine was invented, and in their national, in their national anthem, they do uh, call out aux armes citoyens. So it's, um, you know, they maybe are a little bit more, uh, there's maybe a little bit more spunk to them if we get to this level. But the other point is that if France, uh, for reasons of national dignity, decided to uh, uh, sign in for the, the new Deutschmark bloc or the Neuro, whatever you want to call it, it's going to put them at a tremendous competitive disadvantage um, vis-a-vis -vis countries like Italy. I mean, its manufacturing uh, profile is very, very similar to that of Italy. And if Italy were to derive this huge competitive advantage, it would actually create a huge problem, I think, for, for the, the, the French economy, because they, they haven't gone un experienced anywhere near the, the reforms of the, uh, the German economy. And by reforms, by the way, I should say parenthetically, I, say, I use that term in inverted uh, comm commas because, in fact, the reforms that the Germans introduced were simply massive transfers of labor to capital, the Hartz reforms. Um, they simply simply uh, uh, gave Germany first mover advantage. Uh, they were the first to cut wages across the board, and they did so at a time of global economic growth. So when Germany says, well, we uh, actually uh, took the pain and you can do the same thing, they did it during a time of, of, of economic growth and renaissance. They did it, at, uh, uh, and it helped them to, to gain first mover advantage. And um, it's, it's impossible to see that happen, everyone doing that at the same time. You run into the old uh, fallacy of composition problems. So um, Germany, I think, is, is being quite disingenuous when it suggests that uh, um, the, everyone should go that route. And, and, and besides which, it's actually created to a substantial casualization of labor within the German market itself. The, the old uh, 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 Wirtschaft window that uh, was um, a, a feature of the German economy throughout most of the uh, post-war period, I think, is being eviscerated even there. And my guess is that if you had this um, withdrawal of uh, Germany from the Eurozone and you had this revaluation, um, that you would get into a situation whereby uh, German manufacturers would use the threat of relocation to some of the new, new, new cost, uh, new low cost areas of, say, Portugal or Spain to extort even further uh, reductions in wages from uh, the average German worker. So I suspect uh, this, this, this wasn't going to work. There's one other point I should, I should probably mention. Uh, again, it's a classic case of the, the, the self-inflicted nature of the problems, which is that you have a silent bank run going on across Europe right now. Um, and this is actually, um, um, you couldn't have picked a, 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 bit, a greater speculative doomsday device to, to do this than by, by the Treaty of Maastricht. Because under Article 66 of the EU Treaty, um, there is complete capital mobility within the Eurozone. And the minute you introduce an idea of, of booting someone out, as you have with Greece, or, um, or uh, the, the threat of convertibility risk, which Mario Draghi himself has talked about, then of course, if you're a depositor in Spain and you've got uh, money in a, in, a, in a Spanish bank account and you're worried that somehow 
how this could be, you know, re-denominated into pesetas, or you're Greek and you're worried that you're going to have your savings eviscerated because you'll be, you know, be re-denominated in worthless uh, or increasingly worthless drachmas, and of course you'll move your money. And it's very, very easy. You know, you take your money, you're in your Barcelona bank, you walk down the street from, you know, um, you, you, the, the bank that you have in, in, in Spain, you put it into a Deutsche Mark account, and boom, you know, you're, you're all set. So the, this money can continue to go on, and you're left in this increasingly untenable position where the, uh, the European Central Bank effectively backstops the entire deposit base of the periphery countries. So the, this, is, this is symptomatic of the kinds of, you know, um, incoherence uh, uh, that are, are mounting increasingly uh, day after day uh, within Europe. And uh, it's being exacerbated, as I say, by this horrible implementation of these fiscal austerity programs, which are actually even counterproductive to the, you know, the misguided uh, um, um, uh, disease or, or, or desire for a cure for public profligacy, which is a non-existent disease in the first place. It's a, it's a bit like um, um, blaming uh, the thermometer because it records a temperature of someone that has an influenza. So uh, that, that's, and I think at that, this point, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that uh, and, and open it up uh, for questions now. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Well, just to make the debate a little bit interesting, I would like to fix you an appointment. We are, I think, the 5th of October, uh, 2012. On the 5th of October, 2017, we will meet here again. <laughs> the euro will be there, and there will be more countries in the euro. <laughs> Based on that, <laughs> I agree with a lot of the things that have been said in the sense that I was part of what happened in the corridors when the 3% was put. The problem is when you start giving civil servants carte blanche, the only thing you can expect to have is a disaster. The terms of the ECB for the control of the banks is impractical. The Lee Cannon program that came in the day before yesterday about the change of the banks is talking about putting proprietary trading in a subsidiary. So either it's proprietary trading or it's a subsidiary trading. So they don't even know what they're talking about. And that's where we are. We have a lot of incompetence. And I think the clear assessment I'm making is that don't expect the Minister of Finance to know anything about finance. But this is what I would like to do. Rather than arguing about what happened, I have asked uh, uh, Marshall and Yanis to come in my office. I'm the president of Europe, and I'm telling them the Council of Europe has decided to keep the euro with its current members. We have, we'll do whatever we need to do to get us out of the mess we're in in the next three years. What is your best advice? And I would like you to step in because the real problem is Italy. Yanis. I don't think we need three years. We can do it in three weeks. Go ahead. We can solve the euro crisis in three weeks. You see, we have three problems in Europe at the moment, in the Eurozone. The first concerns the banking crisis. We have insolvent banks, which are in a domino effect dynamic, as Marshall was saying. Secondly, we have a crisis of public debt, not aggregate debt, the Eurozone's aggregate debt is utterly manageable, but the way that it is distrib distributed across the Eurozone, it, most of it is on the shoulders of the least capable to, to withstand it. And the third problem we have is we have a crisis of investment, because we have entered a recessionary period, which is effectively depleting the income from which the debts and the bank losses will have to be repaid. So we need to deal with the banks, with the debt, and with investment. How do we do that? We are not a federal state. And any idea that first we federate and then we solve the crisis is pie in the sky. So how do we do it in three weeks? Firstly, we unify the banking systems. It is ludicrous to have Spanish banks, German banks, French banks in a currency union. Take the case of the, French, of the Spanish banks now. The reason why we have this uh, tug of war between Spain and Germany, it's not between Spain and the ECB, by the way, Marshall. I think it's between Spain, Spain and Germany. And Mr. Draghi, the hapless Mr. Draghi, is just watching this tug of war, incapable of acting on it. The reason why it's happening is this. 
the, the Spanish banks require at least 100 billion euros today in order to keep functioning. Possibly more. And it has been granted. It has been granted, but, 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 it, but the reason why it hasn't been spent is when we say it has been granted from the EFSF, the bailout fund, the idea is that the Spanish government borrows this money in order to give it to the Spanish banks. Now, the Spanish government is insolvent, and that will push it further into insolvency. In June, in the summit in June, Mario uh, Monti and Rajoy and Hollande ganged together up against Merkel and pushed for an agreement which was agreed. The only sensible thing that the, the you know, the European leaders have done in the last three years to decouple the banking crisis from the debt crisis. And how would that, would that be done? That the money for the Spanish banks and other banks in need would go directly to the banks in exchange for equity. And the ECB, possibly with the help of the European Banking Authority, would supervise those banks and wind down the ones that are insolvent. An FDI system. Directly. An FDI system. Exactly, an FDI system. Then that would mean that the banks would be recapitalized in Spain without that, that capital counting against the national debt of Spain. So you would decouple those two weak swimmers that were hugging each other and sinking to the bottom. You would decouple them and, 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 and throw separate life jackets to them. Right? In August, Mr. Schäuble, the German finance minister, published an amazing article in the Financial Times in which he was arguing in favor of banking union. And yet, if you read in between the lines, what he was saying was, nine, it won't happen. Because effectively, he was saying, the banking union that we need is one that effectively uh, supervises the systemic banks, 25 banks in Europe, not 6,000, not the whole of the banking system. Now, the problem, the problem banks in Europe, like Bankia in, 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 Sp in Spain, Dexia, Northern Rock in Britain, are the small ones, the ones that would never be systemic according to this. So effectively, Schäuble was saying, we were bamboozled in June to agree to a banking union. We're not going to do it. That's why I said that he confirms it in the breach rather than in the observance. So if we united the, the banking sectors, which is technically quite straightforward, even the announcement that we're going to do it, even if it takes a year or two to do it, would do the job. It would calm the markets, and it would lessen the banking crisis. Secondly, secondly, the debt crisis. Now, at the moment, you have a situation, which is an amazing situation. You have the European Central Bank stepping in to help Italy, let's say, with its borrowing costs, to reduce them. But doing what? Promising to buy bonds of the Italian state secondhand in the secondary market in order to increase their demand and therefore to reduce their interest rates and ameliorate the problem that the Italian state has refinancing its huge debt. Which is a two trillion euro problem. Two trillion euro problem. And if you add the one trillion of Spain, you have a nice three trillion, again, the triad. And for those who don't know, the EFSF so far has lent 40 billion. For all the numbers that have been around, the only right. intervention that has been done by the European governments is 40 billion. So, what we, but, you know, the only way that Draghi could promise, would make that promise, that he would print money effectively to buy bonds, to do a, a QE like Bernanke, but only in terms of bonds in the secondary markets, the way he managed to pass this through his executive board was by making this conditional that on Troika programs for the, the, the countries that will be uh, participating in this. So he was sure he wouldn't have to do it. So effectively, it wouldn't happen. But, but look at this. One of the things that central bankers supposedly guard with their lives is the notion of central bank independence. And here you have a central bank which is giving it away. Because when the Central Bank of Europe says, I will start doing monetary transactions to, 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 to reduce interest rates uh, in, in Italy in order to stabilize the Eurozone, and therefore the Euro, of which I am the guardian as a European Central Bank, but if the Troika tells me to stop because suddenly they do not approve of the way that the, the Italian government is looking after its own affairs and its reforms and so on, then I will stop. So effectively, he is giving up the concept. Anyway, what could we have done instead? Look, Germany is not going to accept the notion of money printing 
for the purposes of helping the periphery. Correct. They will never accept that. And this OMT operation by Draghi was simply, again, confirming it in the breach rather than the observance. But we don't need to do that, necessarily. There are other ways of doing it. The European Central Bank, for instance, could make an announcement tomorrow morning that would end the debt crisis without printing a single euro. It could make the announcement that from now on, every time a bond matures of any Eurozone member country, including Germany for that matter, it will service, the European Central Bank will pay the bondholders a percentage of that bond which is consistent with that country's Maastricht compliant debt. So if if, if your country, there isn't any such country except for Luxembourg, mm. is on the, on the limit, 60% and below of GDP, within the limits, right? then the ECB promises whoever holds a bond of that country to service all of it, to pay it. And where does it find the money if it doesn't print it? It can issue its own bonds. The ECB could borrow from the Chinese, from German financiers, on behalf of that country, on condition that that country and that can be um, a, a legally binding condition, is going to have a debit account with the ECB in which it pays regularly, every month, every year, every five years, whatever, the money that will be necessary in order to repay that bond, ECB bond, when it matures in 10, 20 years. Because of the ECB's high credit worthiness, the ECB would be able to borrow at one, one and a half, two percent at most. One and a half, I think, around now. So imagine Italy, Spain, France, for that matter, being able to borrow a percentage of their refinancing needs at 1.5%, promising to repay the ECB. Now, that will increase the, uh, it will enlarge the asset books of the ECB and will expose the ECB to a certain risk in case those countries can't repay. Well, there are ways of dealing with this. Firstly, you can make those loans to the ECB. Effectively, there will be loans uh, from Italy, from Spain, to the ECB uh, to have super seniority status, like the IMF does. And secondly, you can have the bailout fund, instead of giving money, le lending money to Italy and to, and to Spain and to Greece and to Portugal, they can actually insure those accounts and those repayments to the ECB. That sounds complicated, but it isn't. It's like, imagine if you have a, a young couple who can't afford their mortgage repayments because their credit worthiness is bad and they are paying 7% to their, to, to their bank. And their parents have a much better credit worthiness because they've had a long relationship with the bank. They get a loan at 2%, 3%. They repay the loan of the youngsters and the youngsters then undertake to repay, to meet the repayments on a monthly basis. So the parents don't pay anything. It's just that they use their credit worthiness on behalf of the youngsters. This is what I'm suggesting, that the ECB could be doing this on behalf. Of, so this is the second thing. And thirdly, and I'm finishing. Quickly, because we want to Investment. <laughs> we need a new deal in Europe. Exactly what FDR did in the 1930s. We need to restart the economies of the periphery, but not only of the periphery, because Germany is falling into the black hole of recession, France. too. And France. Where will the money come from? We have the European Investment Bank. The European Investment Bank is two or three or four times the size of the World Bank. And it has a very proven track record at mobilizing idle savings and channeling, channeling them into long-term investments. One thing stops the EIB from doing that in Europe at the moment. And that is a convention according to which 50% of every project is co-financed by the nation state in which it happens. Now, the nation states are bankrupt. So the, the European Investment Bank has all these business plans ready and willing to, to go, but it can't because Italy and Austria and Greece cannot co-finance them. Well, why not have European Central Bank bonds being issued on behalf of these states, since they will be issued now, according to this plan, to this proposed solution, and the ECB becomes a partner of the EIB to fund a new deal for Europe. We could do this in three weeks. But the political will is not there because the European, the Eurozone was never designed to be a common home for Europeans. Okay, um, I'll go with something a, a bit simpler. Uh, let me say that I, I think the, the common feature of anything that Giannis and I suggest is that it's always going to have the ECB at the apex because the ECB 
is uh, the issuer of the currency, so it's the only uh, entity that actually can credibly make the guarantees of the sort that he is uh, talking about. Now, the ECB can say, well, that's a fiscal function, and uh, we don't want to do fiscal because we're a central bank, and the answer is, well, sorry, you're the only game in town. This is the way you designed it, so it, uh, it has to be the case that you have to be the ones to uh, backstop the program. I mean, you can do it through a, a secondary entity like the EFSF or the ESM, but ultimately they have to be able to use the European Central Bank's balance sheet. My feeling is actually um, that you, you probably could do something much uh, simpler. Uh, you could have a proposal to have the ECB uh, distribute uh, trillions of euros to the national governments on a per capita basis. And um, um, because you're doing it on a per capita basis, um, it's neither a targeted bailout, everybody gets it. In fact, Germany is the largest uh, per capita economy, uh, would, would get the, the, the most amount of money. Um, you, it, frankly, I would let them use the money any way they want, but to, to make this saleable in Germany, I would say that the money uh, would be only be there to be used to retire uh, national debt. You do that by buying the bonds in the secondary market. The ECB is prohibited by the treaty from buying it in the primary market, so you give Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley a commission, buy it in the secondary market. Uh, effectively, you reduce the... Uh, in an accounting sense, you would reduce the national debts because the ECB would be buying bonds and they would be putting reserves into the banking system. Now, technically speaking, the overall stock of financial assets doesn't change, but uh, the reality is that reserves are not counted as part of your public debt. Uh, national bonds are counted as part of your public debt. So, so this, is the, 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 this is how you, you, you backstop it. Um, my other argument is that if you want, uh, you can maintain some restrictions that are embodied in the Stability and Growth Pact. I think it's a stupid uh, uh, level. Let's keep it around closer to something like 6 or 7 percent, which I think would be sufficient to sustain uh, aggregate demand. But the, the, the key point that might make it saleable in Germany is that you're saying, in effect, um, to recalcitrant countries, um, you will not get these annual distributions unless you adhere to the Stability and Growth Pact, uh, maybe with, with these law, new numbers in mind. And, 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 um, and, and the point is that it's much easier to withhold carrots than to get blood out of a stone. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're um, breaching uh, the uh, Stability and Growth Pact today, as virtually every country is, and you're an EU commissioner and you go into Athens and you try to um, extract a fine from them, you'd be lucky to get out alive. But if you actually were to say to a, a country like uh, Greece, well, we don't think you're, you're implementing enough uh, uh, changes, or Italy or Spain, we're going to withhold your payment, but we're going to continue it to these, with these other countries, like, say, Portugal or Ireland, because you've been compliant. And that way you can minimize the, the, the contagion effect. Now, to the argument this is monetization, I would say, look, they're already doing it. I mean, the, the, the fact is that the, the, the securities market program, the SMP, which was initiated uh, by uh, uh, Jean-Claude Trichet in, in, in 2010, um, they crossed the Rubicon then. The way I'm, uh, what I'm suggesting now is that you do it under a, a clear set of guidelines without any kind of political capriciousness uh, where you just wake up one morning and say, well, we'll buy a few uh, um, Greek bonds or Portuguese bonds in the secondary market. There are a clear set of rules and um, even the um, Bank of International Settlements has acknowledged that just because you have reserves in the banking system, it's not necessarily inflationary. Uh, it's not necessarily going to lead to some sort of hyperinflation credit uh, spiral uh, because uh, reserves are there for settlement purposes only. You can't lend out reserves. So that would be my pro uh, uh, proposal. I think it's compliant with the, the Treaty of Maastricht. Um, you could also argue that this is temporary until you do get the institutions in place where you do have that United States of Europe. That will as Yana suggests, take a long time to get there. But this is, to me, a, a sensible interim solution. Um, uh, you, can, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, I'd probably combine that with uh, the proposal that uh, Yanis and Stuart Holland came up with. His, it, it's not so modest proposal. I think it's a very ingenious proposal because I think, do you think you need a, a growth dynamic? But the point is, once you actually establish a backstop, a credible backstop, and I think Paul de Grau has suggested this as well, then you effectively uh, eliminate the solvency concerns. And if you eliminate the solvency concerns, then a, a country uh, like uh, Italy is not going to be borrowing at, at, at 7% or 5 6%. They'll be borrowing at much lower rates, and the capital markets will be opened up to them again. Because, you know, it's, it's comparable, if you like, to um, a company that's uh, debt, very, very debt-strapped, um, 
and all of a sudden uh, Warren Buffett comes in there and refinances them, and all of a sudden their, their, their balance sheet goes from, say, 200% uh, debt to equity down to uh, 75%. And at that point, maybe the, the, the private capital market would say, OK, I'm prepared to fund these guys because they look like a much more uh, viable bet to me. So that's, that's the proposal I have in mind. And um, um, surprisingly, I have spoken to some people uh, in, in, uh, in the German finance ministry, and when you, you, when you talk to them privately, they're, they're, they're not as averse to the idea as, as, as one would think. I think ultimately they may come around to this idea because um, the, the disease of, uh, of declining uh, demand is now starting to spread into the core, and, and it's starting to infect Germany, and it will become an even bigger problem for Germany if um, what's happening in China um, continues to persist because uh, China is becoming an increasingly important uh, market for Germany's capital goods exports. We are already at 7.35. I suggest we take another 10 minutes and you have the floor. So in order to maximize the number of people on the question, short question and short answers. Yes? Uh, as is well known, uh, the, the Marshall uh, program in the 1950s late 40s, early 50s, was partially aimed at uh, putting down the communist parties in these countries and, get, and dealing with it, that unstable problem. Why aren't we seeing something like that from other major countries outside of the euro, from the US, for example, of programs that is attempting to alleviate the national security problem from parties like the Golden Dawn and other far-right neo-Nazi parties? Well, my short answer would be that there's no Cold War now. That there's no Soviet threat, so um, you know they can afford to um, be a little bit more harsh. I don't think the. I mean, there was clearly a national security quid pro quo. The U.S. didn't want to have uh, lose Western Europe to the communists. So, that's uh, my. That would be my short answer. Hmm. Well, let me give you a short answer too. The Marshall Plan was not primarily targeted against the Soviet Union. It was primarily targeted against the fear that the New Dealers in government in Washington had of a repeat of 1929 after 1944-45, after the war, they feared a reduction in demand, a slowdown in industry in, in, in America. And since the, Europe was in smithereens, and no Europeans had enough any dollars with which to buy American goods, the Marshall Plan was part of dollarizing Europe in order to keep American industry going. Next question, yes? Thanks, uh, great talk, you guys. Um, I'm wondering, um, Yanis, you suggested earlier that um, these recycling mechanisms that have been established through Wall Street um, have been there by design. Um, my question is, if we look at um, how situations are being handled right now in Europe and uh, how you also su 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 suggested that policymakers don't really know what they're doing, they don't even know the, what, what the core problems of the systems are, um, how can you, um, or how could you suggest that the grand developments throughout many administrations have been there by, by design? Uh, that would be my question. I have no doubt there is a degree of incompetence in uh, officialdom, but I don't, this is not my thrust. I think that there is design in not having a recycling mechanism. Let me be very br brief. If you create a recycling mechanism that works in Europe, in the Eurozone, then Germany will never be able to exit the Euro in exactly the same way that California cannot, cannot exit the US dollar zone. Imagine the diminution in the bargaining power of the German Chancellor in an EU summit if that happens. At the moment, when Mr. Sarkozy or Mr. Hollande now talk to Mrs. Merkel, they kept their mouths shut. They even signed fiscal pacts that they had campaigned against for a very simple reason, because they are extremely scared of what will happen if Germany leaves the Euro. If the recycling mechanism is instituted, then no one leaves, and suddenly the German chancellor is just one of 17 or 27 uh, heads of state. You want to say something about it? Uh, no, no, I think uh, Jans has pretty well covered it, so. <laughs> Can you open your microphone? Just press on it uh, for a half a minute. Yeah, um, I'm just wondering, um, getting into the psychological aspects of this for the moment, and uh, especially after the, the movie clip, <laughs> what, uh, on the part of the German elites, on the part of the leaders, what motivates um, the, this extremely perverse 
attempt to lower the standard of living of their own people or peoples? What's driving it? What's behind it? You know, I, I wouldn't say it's unique to Germany. I mean, they've perhaps been, you know, are more explicit about it uh, than some of the others. But look, uh, you've got attacks on the, uh, on the, the, on the welfare state going on across the, the, the globe. I mean, you've, it's been, the New Deal is being eviscerated in the US. Um, the, there is a uh, long-standing attack on the European uh, uh, social welfare state. The, the Asians were subjected to this in, in the late 1990s uh, in the Asian financial crisis. So uh, to me, it's the, it's the, it's the logical endgame of, of, uh, of, of the Washington consensus. I, I don't think there's anything particularly sinister about it. I mean, it's very sinister, but I don't think it's, in, it's, it's uh, uniquely German. Um, I mean, I, I know that they talk about Weimar hyperinflation, but the, the reality also is that if you look at the German history closely, um, during the Weimar period, the, uh, the Nazi party only gained, like, they had about five or six percent in the polls, and it wasn't actually until Brüning uh, introduced uh, the austerity in 1931-32 that uh, the, the, their poll numbers uh, went up to about 30-35%. Um, so if, if that is indeed uh, one of the things that's motivating them, it's based on a profound misreading of history. But, and I think that most of them know that. I mean, people like Jens Weidmann know that. But they play on this, um, this um, um, prevailing popular prejudices within the German mind. But, I, but I, I'm not going to single out the Germans and say that they're uh, um, uniquely evil in this regard. So, hmm. I, I take it entirely. Uh, what Marshall has been saying for granted, I agree with him entirely, but I, there is an angle that I want to add to this. When in 2008, Wall Street collapsed, the Europeans initially were very smug about you know, the, the Anglo-Saxons getting their comeuppance until they looked inside the books of their own banks and they, dis they rea realized that their own banks were far more leveraged and in a far worse state than the Wall Street and City of London banks were. Very quickly, the German taxpayer was asked to provide their banks with the creation of the bad banks and so on, a very large amount of money, a, a whole mountain of money. But within a year, by the end of 2009, it was clear that another mountain had to be provided. The German leadership was not eager to go back to the Bundestag and ask for another mountain of money because of the exposure of uh, uh, the German banks, in particular to the Greek debt, to the Portuguese debt, to the Spanish, Spanish debt, to the Italian debt. So the story that was sold to the German electorate was, out of solidarity towards our partners in, in Europe, in the periphery, in the Mediterranean, in Ireland, and so on, we are going to give them a lot of money in their hour of need. Remember that the German working class was being squeezed all those years while the living standards in the periphery were increasing. And to justify to the German hardworking, squeezed laborers why that was happening, austerity became effectively a kind of psychological mechanism for saying, OK, you have been squeezed for all those years. They were having a better time in terms of overall growth rates. Now we're going to give them money in order to pay their debts, but we're going to make them bleed. So austerity has no economic rationale. They understand it, that it's not going to work. But it was the, the, the strategy by which the German elite managed to shift banking losses from the books of the German banks onto the German taxpayer via the Greek state, via the Irish state, via the Italian state. I'd like to add one element because the psychology is very important in what you say, and I would like to go back from the side of the Troika. There is something that strikes me. I'm by all means not an expert on the Greek economy, but it seems to me that some things have been said about the people who don't pay taxes, the corporations who don't pay taxes. And what do we do? We take money from the retirees. It's so easy. It is so cheap. It's a cheap shot. The people who take the decisions take the money from the poorest and keep the rich and the corporates and the army and the church in that situation. And that is what bothers me. Because if the Troika was doing a job that really restores something like a tax equity or uh, an, an, an equitable share of the burden, I think it would be socially acceptable. And of all the mistakes that are being made, what Hollande came with, with his new budget, is a balanced budget. Everybody is furious. That's the best sign that it's the right taxation. The only thing you don't want is a category of the population who is not furious. 
because nobody wants to pay more taxes. But what I'm trying to say is we haven't touched any of the fundamental problems of Greece. We've just gone to the poor and to the people who cannot do anything. And that is what bothers me, because that leads to the springtime in the Middle East, the revolution, and things like that. Because when people are desperate, they have nothing to lose. And that's where we are putting some of those countries. It's the biggest mistake we could do, but it works. You know, it's a system. It's easy. You have to find 13 billion. Okay. You haven't raised the tax fast enough? Get it from the retirees. Diminish the, what you pay to the professors. Uh, cut 20,000 civil servants. Greece had to do 50 billion euros of privatization. Zero. Why? Because it's not sellable unless you sell basically two or three core assets to the economy like electricity. They can sell the gambling they want. Everything else, you know what it is? It is land to be developed. Now, you find me somebody who wants to develop land and create touristic attractions in Greece today. There is nobody. They might end up with a drachma for all we talk about. So that is what really bothers me. And the psychological uh, uh, impact of what we are doing is we are leading countries like Spain and Italy and, and Greece more than anybody else to a level of desperation that we might regret. Yes. You have to press it from press one the buttons. Three. Press it so that it becomes red. Green, I mean. Or green. Here it's red. Technology never works. <coughs> no. You, have you pushed the button? Okay. That's okay. I wanted to ask whether you thought, you know, truly and undoubtedly and inevitably the status quo was self-defeating. I guess, you know, you look at the, the, the current account deficit of the periphery vis a the core, we actually have seen that close. And, you know, certainly it's come at great human cost, and I'm not trying to say that it's desirable, but, you know, we are seeing steps towards relative revaluation with respect to wages and, you know, an increase in competitiveness in the periphery. You see the ECB getting more, you know, willing to use its balance sheet selectively to the politics problem, you know, it looks like these guys are successfully going to impose conditionality before, you know, say, Girl Scone gets into power. And I, we, we have seen it for four years, and I wonder whether it's possible that, you know, we sort of slowly grind this out through the pain trade, but ultimately you could restore, you know, all of these external imbalances in that long trade. Well, I mean... You know, it, it's like, you know, the, the old uh, expression during the Vietnam War, we had to destroy the village in order to save it. I mean, at a certain point, well, what, what is there left to, you know, reform? I mean, you, you, you've got an economic wasteland. Um, um, as far as the whole uh, imbalances go, that to me, that's symptomatic of the, the problem that you don't, when you don't have a, a, a federal structure in place to begin with. I mean, look, um, I'm Canadian. Um, Alberta, uh, one of the Ten provinces uh, um, in, in my country uh, has probably run a current account surplus with the other nine provinces for the last 30, 40, 50 years. I mean, nobody cares. I mean, it's like you know, the, it's it's just one province recycling to another. You know, so the fact that. Um, Germany runs a large uh, current account surplus. It, it wouldn't matter if we had a, 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 a supranational structure. Now, clearly, the, the, the measures that have been taken in the, in the uh, interim have so poisoned the political atmosphere that I think that's, you know, Yanis is right. It's, it's virtually impossible to see how that can be, uh, you can have something like that uh, occurring. But, but to me, uh, you know, this, can, the, 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 it's you know we keep dealing with the symptoms rather than the underlying causes, and until we actually start looking hard at the structures, then I don't think you will, you will solve the problem. I think you're just going to exacerbate it. Hmm. Very very briefly, um, it is completely right that imbalances are diminishing. Canada, my country's Canada account uh, deficit has shrunk incredibly, but that's only because the, the economy has died, and there are no one is importing anything because they can't afford to buy anything. Uh, that's not a good sign. Uh, competitiveness. What does competitiveness mean? The fact that um, wage rates have fallen precipitously in Spain and in Greece means nothing in an environment where two things are happening. Firstly, investment is today in Spain 22% below what it was in 2008. It's only through investment that you increase competitiveness in the long run. And secondly, 
the circuits of credit have died. In, my, in Greece, and increasingly in Spain and Italy, you just, even if you have a profitable company, you have no access to credit. You don't have access to the circuits of, of capital. You have, I know of pro, uh, profitable companies in Greece that are utterly export-oriented. They have a full order book. They have a track record of 10 years of profitability. And they're going bankrupt. And you know why? Because they can't import raw materials. And they can't import raw materials because the foreign suppliers do not accept Greek checks. And let me add one element on Italy, and then I will give you the third. But what does Italy do today? The Ministry of Finance has been the worst disguised place of the country for a long time, run by Mario Draghi and now by somebody called Vittorio Grilli, il professore. And the guy is now Minister of Finance. He was working under Draghi. And you see the great headlines, Italy blows 1% less. Yes. What they do effectively is they refinance 10-year debt with 18 months, three years money. That means in 18 months or three years, we're back. The problem of Greece, of, of Italy, is not just two trillion. The problem of Italy is the next 500 billion. If they pass the next 12 months, which is a 500 billion, that means 40 billion euros refinancing a month. And every month, you can have bad news. You are basically paying Russian roulette, hoping that there is no bullet in the gun at all. And you might be right but you will only find at the 12th bullet. And the problem that I have is that today, because things have gone better, you can create a mega consolidation five-year loan below 5% and everybody will subscribe. But they don't want to do it because, you know, we look like we have a problem. It's about time that they face reality, but the difficulty is that this is the biggest Damocles sword because there is one thing we all know, is that if Italy goes down, we're dead. Because France is going immediately afterwards and we're talking about five or six trillion and nobody can bail anybody for that. Ma'am, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Um, what I find most... Okay? Yeah, it works. Insidious about Great. this crisis is that it's... <laughs> for all intents and purposes, been invisible for a number of years now. In other words, the way in which it's constantly discussed and never presented. And um, I am not an economist. I'm an ancient Greek historian. And it's because of my love and involvement with Greece that I have become, over the last few years, absolutely and completely obsessed with this unreal surreal situation that I see unraveling. And in fact, I just got back from Italy, southern Italy. And I am just astonished. I'm very grateful to have found through Yanis Varoufakis's book and uh, here again at this conference, the voice of logic and reason. But it is astonishing to me, and I think that it adds another complete dimension to everything that's been discussed, that it is constantly under wraps. Every single article in every publication worldwide, this huge um, kind of effort, massive effort is being made to prevent any of these issues from surfacing and from any uh, public awareness, even among um, highly skilled and intelligent uh, academically educated people to disseminate in any way, shape, or form. And I think it is my absolute astonishment at the lack of concern while, you know, Greece um, sunk desperately into the situation and the type of explanations that we've been hearing all along for what is happening to Greece. And I think that that's really what my question is, really. And what my st it's kind of a blend of a question a statement because it stems from my utter and complete astonishment at the existential nature now of this crisis that is destroying the European 
world, um, city by city, town by town, destroying the lives of um, people who were previously able to sustain themselves. Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't uh, disagree. I think um, there has been some coverage, but I think part of the uh, narrative, of course, is that um, it's to blame the victim, you know. I mean, you, you don't hear about suffering Greeks, you hear about Greek tax cheats or, you know, um, uh, or public profligates in, in Italy or, you know, corrupt, uh, you, know, um, you know, these corrupt criminals in, in, in um, these mafiosi in Italy. I mean, that, that's, that's really the uh, extent of it. You don't hear about, say, um, the kind of criminality that goes on in the, within the banks that, um, you know, created these, this mess in the first place. So, so that's part of it. And then part of it after a while is just, um, you know, if you, you, you try to reduce it to the nature of uh, statistics, uh, it's a form of cognitive dissonance. dissonance. If you read uh, Hannah Arendt's uh, uh, book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, I don't want to get into the Nazi metaphors too much, but I mean, you know, the way she describes Eichmann, he's a, he's a bureaucrat, you know, he just fills out his quotas, you know, he just, um, it's not, you know, you're not sending thousands of Jews to their deaths in concentration camps, you're filling a quota. And when you think about it in those terms, it sort of anesthetizes it. Yeah, it becomes a number, so that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. Let me, I feel the need to, 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 to step in here. It's what happens when vested interest employs oversimplification to exploit prejudice. In Greece, I've been involved, as you may know, uh, in, uh, or not, in uh, the public debate now for three years. And it is my personal experience that Journalists, especially financial journalists, are suffering a personal dichotomy and a personal tragedy. When they speak to me, when the microphones are switched off and the cameras are absent, we almost agree. And then you read their piece in the newspaper or hear their editorial on the television, and you think, my God, is this the same person? And then they meet you in a, in a bar or in a restaurant, and they apologize because their job depended on writing that. Outside Greece, look, it's very simple. Either Europe would have to, ac to accept that there, is no, that there is no such thing as a Greek crisis, that there is a systemic Eurozone crisis where Greece is a symptom, or it would have to blame it on the Greeks. It's either or. The European elites were not ready and are still not re ready to accept that this is a systemic crisis. So it is quite natural to play on the prejudices of the northerners about the southerners, to invoke the metaphor or the allegory, the Aesopian allegory of the, grass, the grasshopper and the ant, to paint the Greek as the grasshopper and the German as the ant, in order to explain away on the basis of a, ve of a story which you can relate in five seconds, the crisis. When in reality, of course, what you have is a coalition of grasshoppers of the north and of the south contriving solutions and crises that are at the expense of both the ants of the north and of the south. But that's a much harder story to tell in 10 seconds while the camera is playing, is recording. I'd like to uh, give you a bit of hope. The three of us have become journalists. <laughs> and I'm blogging in Le Monde in France and in Huffington Post. Many of the things that are happening they are there black and white. We knew way before. And I have come to the conclusion that the question is not that we don't know. We do know. The facts are even public. The various 45 billion euros that Italy has to refinance every month, of course you have to do a lot of search, and it's in Italian, but if you really want, you'll find it. So. I, was, I started being that journalist in 2008 because of the financial crisis. And I came back and I said, but we knew it all along. Greenspan, the great Alan Greenspan, made statements that today look totally irresponsible. Now, is it a hedge fund? So that might explain that. But the reality is that what you are raising is how you manipulate information for political reasons. And 
I have written columns in Le Monde that were in direct contradiction with what the official economic journalist was supposed to do. There is something going on where people who know and who have a voice and who start being recognized because of blogs and social networks and everything are starting to be there. And you know what's happening now? Is that when I come with something pretty con controversial, I get quite a few phone calls from journalists who try to understand because now that it's in the out, they can start talking about it while before they were just asked not to pay too much attention to it. So hopefully there is another media democracy going on. It's only the beginning. But I have some hope that we don't spend nights writing in a useless way. Any other? Yes? Uh, it seems to me that uh, a lot of the debates are oftentimes engaging in a form of obscurantism, in my opinion, primarily because uh, I think that people tend to dan dance around the main issue, and that is that the crisis, to a large degree, was created by derivative speculation, and uh, that one of, the, one of the possible solutions that people have talked about, that people have debated, though it's, as you just were pointing out, uh, somehow absent from the mainstream dialogue, and that is the idea of taxing and or banning all derivatives. That is to say, a essentially a sales tax on speculation. If I pay a sales tax on everything I buy, how come Goldman Sachs doesn't pay a sales tax on their 10,000 trades a minute or whatever they're doing with their flash trading? So the question of taxing and or banning derivatives as a possible solution, I mean, we could talk about bond buying and various other ways of, you know, uh, finding stopgap solutions, but as was mentioned, the core problem seems to me to be derivative speculation. I mean, we could talk about whether it's credit default swaps or whatever kind of derivative it is, but at its core it is the derivatives problem and it, that is the cancer that seems to be eating Europe from within. So um, where, it, where do people stand on the issue of taxing and or banning derivatives as a solution? Well, let me say something very briefly. It is a crisis that, was, that began with the financial sector and everything you're saying is completely right, but it would now be a little bit like locking the gates after the horses have bolted. You see, the creation of, I continue to call it private toxic money, the derivatives, the mountain of derivatives which started to operating as a form of private money, created the circumstances for the crash, which then left us, after those derivatives died, because let's take CDSs, for instance, and CDOs, their significance has, complete, has diminished entirely after 2008. They're, you know, the Wall Street is trying to prop them up again and to start milking them again for all they're worth. But th those markets have effectively rendered themselves largely relevant, at least for now. I am all for regulating them. I'm all for taxing them. All, I'm all for, you know, uh, just putting these bastard shoes shoes, feet in one shoe, as we say in Greek, right? But now the problem that we have inherited from that crash has shifted onto other realms, to the realm of public debt, to the realm of a recession in, the, in, in, in manufacturing throughout Europe, to the banking system, the bread and butter bank, banking system that does not... In, so now we need to fix this in a way that Roosevelt did in the 1930s. And that is a big project which includes regulation, just like Roosevelt had to, but it's not enough. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, look, this is ultimately a, a, not a problem of derivatives. It's a problem of politics, money politics. I mean, we, we should be uh, regulating and taxing these uh, uh, matters. But, you know, um, it's like Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois said uh, a few years ago, uh, and it was in the U.S. context, but I think it applies equally to Europe. He said the banks basically run the place. So until we have um, fundamental political reforms, I think... Um, we're going to have to wait. Um, I guess the one thing to use the FDR analogy, it really wasn't until four years into the Great Depression that um, you know, we had uh, um, the, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the reforms that were finally introduced which did regulate the financial sector. So I guess what, we're into uh, year three or four now of the crisis. So you know, maybe, we're, maybe we're due in the next, uh, the next uh, year or two. So, but it, it's a political problem ultimately. Hmm. You will have the last word or the last question. Yes. Um, th thank you very much um, for all this. And uh, um, I would like to go back a little bit to the uh, discussion of uh, 
psychology. Um, first of all, I, I would like to say that um, <clears throat> in terms of psychology, uh, one of the things that uh, is happening both in, in Greece and it has happened here also is the fact that uh, various con constituents uh, promote their own, their own um, view of things. Uh, and I'm referring uh, particularly to um, uh, what you said about Golden Dawn ha having 22% of the um, uh, of support of Greek uh, of Greek people right now. This is um, a totally fabricated um, thing that Golden Dawn itself has been putting out in order for itself to appear uh, as being um, as being more um, um, palatable and uh, and popular. Um, I mean, if you see the different uh, the various different. Uh, uh, polls that are being run in, in Greece, you will see that uh, Golden Dawn uh, has not moved up from uh, at most 10%. Um, but it contributes to a general, more general psychological state, I think, um, that we see um, at work in uh, Europe in, uh, in general. Thinking about the psychological state, um, you showed us very well uh, that, uh, of course, the, although the financial crisis that uh, Europe and Greece in particular are going through right now um, is um, really explained economically, I mean, by, through economics, um, I think they have shown us that the real way of getting out of it uh, would require the help of psychiatry. Um, the, but what I, what I would like to ask you in terms of this, I mean, in connection to this, is, is the following. When, um, when the Troika first came to Greece and um, started uh, making all the, the you know, disp dispensing money and dispensing, um, uh, uh, or rather requiring uh, changes, the first thing, as, as you all said, the first thing that happened in Greece was that instead of uh, zeroing in on uh, uh, high income, uh, classes and taxing them uh, effectively, what happened was that, of course, everybody, the, the state went into first for the poor and particularly for the people in the, in the, uh, in the uh, public sector and the uh, pensioners. Uh, four days ago, w we read, I read in the, uh, in the news that um, with the Spanish uh, case, uh, what, what the uh, Spanish Prime Minister said was that uh, pensions were off the table completely. So that pensions would not be affected by any sort of... So what I'm wondering, and, and I would like to ask you all, is this. Why did Greece go straight to the pension system and, and agreed to eviscerate its, uh, um, its social welfare system, uh, whereas Spain is actually resisting? Is it a case of complete and utter uh, uh, complicit, Greek complicity of the, the Greek governments with the, um, with the Troika? Is it complete uh, um, incompetence? Is it um, that, uh, what, what is it that actually makes our government, Professor Varoufakis, go there? Let's ask Yanis. Mm -hmm. Well, firstly, I don't think that there is a fu fundamental difference between space and Spain and Greece. Spain also went for austerity that attacks the incomes of pensioners and uh, lower wages. Just like this. The difference is uh, time lag. Uh, they are now where we were two years ago. And if you will recall, uh, the diminution in pensions was not that great initially in Greece. The other thing I want to say is that, well, very quickly about pensions, it's the easy way. When you, you know, if, if I were to make you or me or myself Minister of Finance in the place of my friend Stunaras, right, especially with a collapsing economy, you just can't raise taxes. So if you're going to reduce the deficit, you're going to, 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 to cut whatever is available to you. And pensions are a very simple solution. Misanthropic, but simple. But I want to, to take issue with the, the point you made about Golden Dawn. Now, the 22% is, is, is not real. But nevertheless, Golden Dawn is extremely powerful in Greece. It has made huge inroads. And I will dare say it has gained power before gaining government. Because it has already shifted the agenda of the other political parties, the ones that are governing. For instance, in the question of migration, 
the question, we have a situation where the socialist minister before the election in, in, in June, or May, whenever it was, the socialist minister, minister of public order had the police apprehend migrant, uh, illegal migrant prostitutes, subject them to HIV test, and publish on the internet their photograph if they turned out to be positive in response to demands by Golden Dawn. But you know, this is the lesson from 1929. The first thing that happens when you have such a crisis is the common currency goes, and the second thing that happens is you have the serpent's egg hatching. This is precisely what we have in Greece. And if you, the, the thing that concerns me the most about Golden Dawn is that if you read their horrific pamphlets, there are chunks of them, the analysis of what's going wrong in Greece, which are perfectly spot on. Just like if you read a Goebbels uh, uh, speech from 1927-28, you'll find a large segment of it which was absolutely spot on regarding the analysis of what was going wrong in Germany. Until then, you, you, know, you, you get to the passage where it starts talking about Jews in Germany or now about Nigerian migrants or uh, Albanians. Um, enough. So we might have to bid Professor Ujo uh, farewell, but I'm going to continue doing my best attempt at moderating because there are still people who I think have some questions and we want to keep this going for as long as possible. I know I have some questions and so do some people online. So if you're still able to stay and you don't have anything better to do on a Friday night, please continue uh, to ask and we'll hopefully the two speakers will have a bit more time for you. Um, a few more a few minutes. Okay. You're okay. So, yeah, if you want to. Does anyone else have a question? Oh. Yeah. Einstein was a big fan of thought experiments. Well, allow me to. Einstein. Speak, speak Can up. Can I speak up? Einstein was a big fan of thought experiments. So, allow me to. A little bit easier to do that. Let's say that there were a gene who could fix all of this financially $100 trillion in assets backed by gold, silver, gas, special drawing rights, you name it. Let's say he existed, and you said, fix it. What would you do with all of that? Would you build bombs to kill people? This is, this is my question. If I, were to, if I had the power to turn the financial spigot on in the US, what is there to motivate me to do that? If I could get people to work, if I could industrialize things, get things moving, why would, I, why would someone do that? If the end result of that is starving people, dying children, I don't know. That's, that's my question. Well, I mean, the short answer is, you know, at some point you hope that there's a little bit of um, slightly more than narrow extremely narrow self-interest. I mean, you know, I, I think when, when, um, when the New Deal was introduced and you had some of the, uh, the oligarchs at that time going to the White House and complaining about it, you know, um, FDR basically said, you know, you, you give up a little bit of the pie now so that there's still a pie left to, uh, you know, um, that you, you can still dominate. I mean, it's, uh, you know, give a little bit. And I, so I think that's the, the broader self-interest. You hope that at some point you, 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 leave them, you leave a market so that these guys can at least survive even if they, they, they give up a little bit more now. Um, that's the short answer. <laughs> well, very briefly, let me say that the world we live in is in dire need of lots of stuff which it doesn't have, like medicine that is inexpensive and that would reduce human suffering immensely, education that needs to be highly labor intensive, in other words, we need more teachers on the ground and not metrics that uh, measure productivity in education on the basis of how many thousands of students one person can educate. We live in a, on a planet which is actually experiencing its own environmental crisis and a planet that we are killing on the basis of antiquated technologies. So there is so much that we can do with investment and putting people to actually producing the things that would make for a better planet and, and a better society. Okay, so, um, I'm very sorry, it turns out that we have, uh, the speakers have to run to a dinner, so I'll just try and summarise all of the web different comments that we've got in kind of one large question, and that is, uh, we talked a little bit about media democracy, and I hope this series is doing some small part towards getting this message out, but with regards to real democracy, and we were talking about toxic private money as a source of a lot of the growth in recent times, and uh, we 
Yanis talked a lot about surplus recycling of internal demand. Uh, so my question is, if you have some alternative to that, and we have the first two seminars talked a lot about what a fiat currency is and the way that it can be created without the necessity to go uh, through the banks and issue debt and things like this. If you have an alternative to this model um, that can actually put power back in the hands of, of a real democracy, is it likely you're going to see these same types of problems or do you think you know, people like Mario Monti getting put into power to try and deal with these problems without democratic oversight? And just sort of how does this stuff tie back into you know, going beyond just fixing the current structure of the Eurozone, but actually to try to create a, an approach towards the creation of money, the, the spending of deficits and things like that, that are actually uh, based in some semblance of public purpose. Well, it's a, it's a tough one, uh, no question. I mean, I, I hate to say it that you, you, you know, I think Rahm Emanuel said, don't let a good crisis go to waste. I mean, we, we have, but so we might have to wait for the next um, crisis before you finally get the necessary um, political changes that will, um, you know, uh, get back to um, government um, being aligned with broader public purpose. I mean, Jamie, Jamie Galbraith wrote a very good book, uh, the, the Predator State, um, and I think that's the uh, um, the challenge. Uh, that's the, that, that's the elephant in the room. That you know, especially those of us of, of uh, shall we say, a Keynesian orientation, have to acknowledge that you know you have this um, political. Uh, um, entity which is uh, primarily become a vehicle for corporate predation and, and that's the thing that we, that's the real challenge I think we have to answer right now and that's, that's not really an economic problem, that's a political problem. Yeah. Well, briefly, I think we need to separate two tasks that are facing us. The first one concerns arresting the free fall in the Eurozone which is affecting the prospects of the global economy including of course the United States. When you are in a 1929, 1931, 1932 period, or in a period like now between 2008 and 2012, what you need to do is you need to stop that free fall because that free fall feeds the Golden Dawn, the Nazis, the misanthropes, the xenophobes, and all those who actually uh, prey on misery. The second question is a different kettle of fish and a bigger issue. Can capitalism be civilized? Once the crisis has been arrested, then we can enter that conversation there, we can disagree. Personally, I think that the system where collectively produced values privately appropriated is prone to the crisis that we've had. Okay, well, I suppose we'll have to call it a night there. If you do have questions, please feel free to submit them on the online forum, and uh, we will get them to the speakers and hopefully be able to continue this dialogue. Thank you very much for everybody who was able to come, and uh, thank you for the speakers again.